We're going to talk about a juvenile's legal right to treatment. This concept of a legal right to treatment was introduced to the mental health field in 1960 by Morton uh, Birnbaum. The argument was that individuals who are deprived of their liberty because of mental illness, they're entitled to treatment to correct the condition. So the question was, does a juvenile have a right to rehabilitation treatment? While such treatment is grounded in the historical development of the juvenile court, it has only developed recently, when I say recently, in the last 50 years, into a legal right for challenging the conditions of confinement in juvenile facilities. Uh, there's been a series of court cases. Courts have found that juveniles do have a right to treatment under the Constitution and under state statutes. However, the form of treatment and how treatment should be prescribed is generally still left up to correctional authorities. So let's go through a series of these cases. Now, the cases that I'm going to run through, these first few, are federal court cases none from the U.S. Supreme Court. And I say that because their jurisdiction, the area that their jurisdiction is, will cover what these laws are. Until we have a Supreme Court ruling, we may have different uh, ideas or rules depending on the location of the court who's made the ruling. So the first one is the inmates of the Boys Training School versus Affleck uh, from 1972. I'm not going to run through the the list, but uh, on page 409, this case established minimum standards for all juveniles confined in training schools, in training schools, not in the actual uh, secured facilities, but in a, in a training school. Other cases related to right to treatment while confined, Nelson versus Haney, from 1974, the plaintiffs claim uh, that the general operation of an India, uh, Indiana boys' school violates certain Indiana statutes governing the treatment of juveniles in defendant's custody, as well as um, the juvenile's right to rehabilitative treatment being guaranteed by the U.S. Constitution. Uh, additionally, the juveniles point to certain institutional practices and policies of the institution that were said to offend their rights uh, that are secured by the various amendments. The two that I'm going to point out is the Eighth Amendment, uh, harsh and unusual punishment, and the Fourteenth Amendment. The Fourteenth Amendment states generally that states and other municipalities uh, have to afford due process under our federal constitution. So meaning that the Eighth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution applies to states as well. So the practices and policies that this uh, boys' school was involved in that relate to our discussion is the use of corporal punishment, using drugging techniques like tranquilizers for treatment purposes, and the claim was that they have a right to treatment outside of just being drugged up, and um, a right not to be subjected to corporal punishment. And the court said, yeah, that's, that's, we agree. We agree. They said that the juveniles do have a right to treatment above and beyond just giving them tranquilizers. And corporal punishment was a form of cruel and unusual punishment. So taking a step in the right direction regarding right to treatment or how they are being treated. The next case was uh, Morales versus Truman. This uh, extended to development of educational skills and vocational skills, adequate living conditions, and medical and mental health treatment, where courts ruled that that has to happen in correctional facilities for juveniles. Uh, in Pena versus New York State, this uh, involved using solitary confinement or isolation, and using hand restraints and tranquilizing drugs to treat youths. And the New York courts said that all of that violates the Eighth Amendment. So all of these are state court cases, federal 
cases in various states making these rulings. So that last one I just read regarding New York State applies to New York State. So facil juvenile facilities in New York State can't use solitary confinement, hand restraints, and tranquilizing drugs uh, in quote-unquote treating juveniles. It's in violation of the Eighth Amendment of the Constitution. However, our Ralston versus Robinson case is a very important case. This comes from the Supreme Court, meaning this ruling everybody has to follow in, in the country. Every correctional facility would have to follow. Uh, and in this case, however, the Supreme Court limits a juvenile's right to treatment, indicating that the right doesn't extend once, pro uh, once proven that a juvenile's propensity to be dangerous outweighs possible effects of rehabilitation. In this Robinson case, the juvenile uh, who brought the lawsuit committed a murder while in a juvenile facility. This individual was ultimately tried as an adult and committed into an adult facility and was treated like an adult in the facility. And the argument was it's a juvenile is a juvenile and should be afforded those rights of treatment. And the court said, no, once the, the, that right doesn't extend, once it's proven that the juvenile's propensity to be dangerous outweighs the possible effects of any rehabilitation. Another limitation on a juvenile's right to treatment comes from Santana versus uh, Colazo, which is out of federal court out of Puerto Rico from 1983. Um, limits the right of treatment involved challenging, again, the conditions of confinement. Uh, some of the conditions that were challenged were the no visiting policy, couldn't have any visitors, there was poor educational opportunities, and there was poor medical care. And this federal court said, yeah, juveniles do not have a constitutional right to treatment. It's up to the facility. So jurisdictions that are governed under this federal court down Puerto Rico. I think it was the first, um, the first, the first circuit federal court cases. So any of the, uh, I think Florida is part of that regime of, uh, states under that circuit will have to follow this rule until the Supreme court steps in and makes a decision otherwise, which has not happened yet. If we have a Supreme court case that says, Juveniles have an absolute constitutional right to treatment. Until we have that, it's going to be decided by the individual states. But what we do know from the Supreme Court is that once a juvenile has been established to have a propensity to be dangerous, and that outweighs any effects of rehabilitation, then it's not required, especially when they're transferred to an adult facility and treat it as an adult to carry on from there. Let's talk about aftercare and reentry after uh, they've been in, in a secured correctional facility, juveniles. Aftercare provides transitional assistance to juveniles to help them adjust to community life. It's not quite like parole in the adult criminal justice system. Um, it differs in that the juveniles are still within the correctional facilities, except it kind of, uh, to, for lack of a better uh, term, it's a reduced uh, facility. They go into a community residence. They're still under supervision. They have less uh, restriction on their movement, but there's, they have a little bit more freedom to move around but then they spend a little bit of time in this transitional facility uh, to make the adjustment into community life. Reentry is a little bit more like parole. It is the process of returning to society upon release from a secured custody facility. Involve, it, it does involve aftercare services, but it includes preparation for release from confinement. Uh, there's pre-release planning. They actually meet with a particular counselor or parole officer. Uh, it is the kind of an, an entire whole process and experience of the transition from correctional facility into families, communities, 
uh, in society. Unfortunately, uh, many youths return to unstable home settings. They struggle to remain in school and lack the skills needed for employment upon leaving secured care placement. Uh, Further, the majority of youth involved in the juvenile justice system have a mental health disorder and support services in their home communities are hard to arrange until they are formally released. This can cause a gap in services that negatively impact the reentry process. So to improve the odds of success for youth reentering the community, the justice system uh, related agencies and communities must plan for what needs to occur for reentry when the youth enter the juvenile system. So right from the beginning, they think exit at entry. So that's, they're kind of already thinking that when they come in. So therefore coordination and collaboration between agencies and across services and supports are necessary to, um, they're necessary at multiple phases of reentry. There are four kind of main four phases. They, the enter, the entry phase, the moment the youth enters the placement. Then they have their placement phase. This is the time the youth is in the secured care facility. They have a transition phase, the actual act of leaving the facility and reentering the community, which is immediately before and immediately after the date of exit. And then there's the community-based aftercare phase. It could be, it's usually, a, I mean, you can't put a, a, a time frame on it, but generally it's about 120 days, could be longer. Um, and this is the period of time after youth returns to community. Successful reentry programs and practices should ensure the delivery of prescribed services and supervision in the community, specifically by fostering improved family relationships and functioning, reintegration into school, and mastery of independent life skills, youth building, uh, resilience, and positive development to divert them from delinquent and other problematic behavior. They're usually supervised by a parole officer or caseworker uh, case to maintain contact with the juvenile, want to make sure correction plans are being followed. Uh, they generally show interest in, in care and the success uh, of reentry, the parole officer that is, and, and helps the juvenile uh, in making that adjustment. The juvenile parolee, will have kind of like probation has, you know, a set of standards that they have to follow. And these sets of standards are created by the Crimson department, not, not the, not the court. Um, they have to adhere to a reasonable curfew that's set by a parent or a work, uh, a youth worker or the parole officer or a caseworker. Refrain from associating with persons whose influence would be detrimental, detrimental to their success. Finish that out. Uh, attend school in accordance with the law. Abstain from drugs and alcohol use. Report to their youth worker or parole officer when they're required. Refrain from acts that would be crimes if committed by an adult. Refrain from operating an automobile, um, uh, automobile without permission of the caseworker or parent, refrain from being habitually disobedient and beyond the lawful control of parent or other legal authority, refrain from running away from the lawful custody or parent or other legal authority. Those are pretty general rules. There will be some specific ones related to the actual uh, specific juvenile if treatment's required. You know, if they're old enough to, they might require them to work if they're already kind of completed some sort of educational program uh, or vocational program. So let's talk about if these rules are violated. What do you think happens? Kind of like probation. The juvenile is subject to have his release status or his parole revoked and be returned to incarceration. And they are afforded all of the same rights as an adult on parole would have, meaning they have, if they are violated, they have a right to an attorney. They have a right to know what's being claimed or the, the charges being made against them. They're entitled to have a hearing before the judge to have a outcome determined. They have the right to present their own case and they have the right to ask questions of the parole officer or the one, the individual or whoever is making the charges or claim against them. 
So what's our future? Juvenile corrections, well, the debate is ongoing regarding effectiveness of community versus institutional treatment, but the most effective secured corrections programs are the ones that provide individual services for a small number of participants. Um, there's debate regarding effectiveness of con uh, correctional treatment versus other delinquency prevention. The goal or the focus is on deinstitutionalization of juvenile offenders. Um, as we mentioned, there's a disproportionate number of minorities who are incarcerated, and that is an issue. And focusing on aftercare and reentry services. These are a critical part of the transition. And to have that transition be successful, there really needs to be aftercare, reentry um, plan in, in place with strict supervision. So this concludes our discussion on juvenile corrections and the materials in chapter 14, as well as the materials in the course.